G'day guys, this is our fourth verbatim exercise. I trust you're getting some learning out of these exercises. It's definitely the sort of thing that would have helped me when I started in this ministry to give me uh, a clearer idea about appropriate responses and the responses that aren't helpful. So I hope that's this has been helpful for you. So I've got another verbatim from one of my volunteers. I'll read through it and then provide some feedback. So let me just share my screen. Here we go. Let's get into it. Hello, Alan. My name is Gordon. I'm one of the chaplains. I'm visiting the ward and available if patients would perhaps like a chat. Actually, that would be a nice change. And how are you feeling today? Well, not so good. I've lost my appetite. I can't keep anything down. I drink a little, but everything comes back up. Sounds like you're having a rough time. I don't know. I'm just so tired all the time and I can't eat. It sounds like that is really getting you down. Well, I just can't keep much food down and I seem to be losing my appetite too. Hmm. But you can drink, okay? Sometimes. See? Just slowing down a little sometimes may help. Yeah. Well, I like to go outside. It's restful looking at the garden, but I'm so tired. Well, it sounds like that change of scenery could be good for you. Do you want me to take you outside? Okay. So they go outside. Patient then says, I got to drive past my home a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I heard from staff that your niece took you. A nice outing? It was okay. At least I got to see the outside of the place. Last time I went in, the place was a wreck. Everything emptied out, drawers all opened up. I was hoping to be able to go back there, but they say I can't live there on my own. I thought maybe my granddaughters could stay there and then I could stay in part of it, but they don't want to do that. And my wife doesn't even want me to rent it out. Your wife is not living there? No, she's in a home too. She doesn't come and see me either. Neither does my grandson. Well, not having that contact must be hard for you. The only people that see me are my niece and nephew. I don't know. I'm going to be 90 next week. I don't know what will happen after that. We'll see if I even make it to next week. Well, you're missing your home, but at least you have your niece and nephew to visit you, and they, that shows they care for you. Yeah, well, we'll see. We probably should go back in now. And that's really where the conversation concluded. Okay, so some feedback. Um, C1 was the introduction. I thought that the chaplain was very clear in his introduction. Guys, this is really important. When you go to visit a patient, always clearly identify yourself and give them the choice as to whether or not they want to visit. Now, sometimes people will say, yes, sit down, but they're still actually really trying to work out who you are. Um, not everyone knows who a chaplain is. So when they ask you to sit down, sit down, I often will remain quiet and wait for them to start the conversation. But if they start with something like, well, what do you want to talk about? You see, that might indicate to me that maybe they were just being polite. Maybe they really didn't want me to sit down. But I give them an opportunity to see if they really want to have a chat. I might say something like, um, why don't you tell me what's most important to you? Or what's the worst thing about being here? Something like that. What are you most pa passionate about? And just based upon that response, I'll see really whether they want to talk or not. And if I get the sense that they were really just being polite and they don't really want to talk right now, then I'll let them off the hook and I'll exit the conversation pretty quickly because I know that there are patients who are looking to talk with someone like me. Okay. C2, the chaplain asked, how are you feeling? Guys, that's not what I typically say because I find that the majority of the times when you ask a question like that, people start talking about their physical condition. And that's what happened in this conversation. So again, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about anything a person wants to talk about, but I want to leave, I want to leave the agenda open in a sense. And that question, how are you feeling, very often directs the conversation towards a physical condition conversation rather than something else. So um, it, it's not a question that uh, I tend to ask, okay? Um, C3, you're having a rough time. 
again, just try and avoid words like rough. Feelings like concerned or scared or worried would be better. You know, many people find it difficult to use feeling words, but sometimes we can help them when we start using the feeling words. So again, avoiding words like hard, difficult, rough, tough. Um, avoiding those words can can be helpful for the person. And, and it, even if they use those sort of words, that's fine. But I guess as someone who their bread and butter is communicating with people, we, we want to try and avoid those phrases where we can, even though most people get what we mean. C4, the chaplain says, sounds like that's really getting you down. Yeah, that's an okay response. Remember, the patient will always supervise you. The other person will always supervise you. If it's not completely accurate, he may not be feeling down about it, but certainly this person is going to get the sense that the chaplain is listening and he's trying to understand the impact of this on me, okay? C5, um, when the chaplain says, mm, but you can drink, okay? That's a question that didn't need to be asked. Um, I really just want to respond to what the person's telling me. I wanna contain my questions. I wanna contain my curiosities. It's not really important to me right then in that moment to know whether they can also drink okay, you know? But you'll see that in response to C5, the patient does respond. And that's what happens when you ask questions in pastoral conversations. The person out of politeness and normal response answers your question. And so you see here in C6, the chaplain is having to say, hey, listen, just slow down a little bit when you're taking a drink because the patient to demonstrate that he can drink took a big gulp of water and then had a bit of a cough. And you can see here that leads the chaplain into giving him some advice about not gulping his liquids. Um, again, it's not helpful. It's not necessary. Um, everyone can work out the consequences of gulping liquids and, you know, change the way they're drinking accordingly. Um, this just sort of indicates to me that the chaplain's uncomfortable. He's not 100% clear on his role in this space with the other person. And he's really looking for any opportunity to sort of be helpful uh, in a practical sense. C7, sounds like that change of scenery could be good for you. Do you want me to take you outside? Um, here, I would not have asked that question. Uh, the patient only expressed that they enjoyed being in the garden, that they found it restful. Um, they probably very much like being in the sunshine, hearing the birds, the fresh air, like we all do. So this wasn't an opportunity for the chaplain to come to the rescue and jump in and say, oh, would you like me to take you outside? You see, guys, again, this shows to me the chaplain's feeling uncomfortable. He's looking for ways to be helpful and useful so he can walk away from this conversation saying, yeah, I did a good thing. I was helpful. They're better off since they saw me, you know, because I was able to do things for them. Remember, for us as chaplains, it's far more important to focus on who we're trying to be in a conversation, what we're trying to be rather than what we're trying to do for someone. OK, that's really important. I also trust that if patients want something from me, they can ask. You know, the patient could have said, look, I'm not sure how much time you have, but it would be wonderful if you had the time to take me out into the garden for 10 or 15 minutes for a bit of fresh air. And, and then I can respond to that, but not look to problem solve when there wasn't even a problem. Um, as I said, the patient was just expressing how they enjoy the garden. C8, I heard from staff that your niece took you on a nice Audi. Oh, it was okay. At least I got to see the outside of the place. Last time I went in, the place was a wreck. Everything emptied out, drawers all opened up. I was hoping now to go back there, but they say I can't live up there on my own. I thought maybe my granddaughters could stay there and then I could stay in part of it, but they don't want to do that. I can't even rent it out. My wife doesn't want me to. Your wife is not living there? Guys, that's a question that shouldn't have been asked. For me, what the patient said in P8 is really the center of 
what his ultimate concern is right here. There are other concerns, of course, but a big part of this man's, shall we say, suffering is the fact that he would love to be able to stay in his own home. He would love to leave this nursing home and go back to that safe, comfortable, familiar place that he calls home. But the authorities, the doctors are saying, no, no, no. At your age, we don't think it's right for you to live by yourself. It's probably not safe. So you're going to have to either stay here permanently or go into another nursing home permanently. And yet there's this sense that if there was only some family members like his granddaughters that could come and stay with him in the house, then he could go back home because he wouldn't be by himself. But they're not able to do that. And again, it doesn't matter all the variables as to why his granddaughters are unable to do that. I just need to understand that that's how he feels. This is what he would like. Because, again, like I say here, how would you feel if this was you? How would you feel if all you want to do is get back home and you just need some assistance from family, but without it, you've got to either stay where you are or go into another nursing home, you know? So the question your wife is not living there is completely irrelevant to what he just said, okay? Try and respond to what you're hearing. Contain your questions. OK, because he gave us an awful lot in that in that paragraph that we can respond to. Remember, we don't convey that we're understanding someone when we ask them a question. Which is why a question ruins the space we're trying to create with a person. You know, we're trying to create this space where this person, very often a stranger, feels safe enough to share something really precious with them, really important to them with us. And so we want to be respectful of that. We don't want to come in with simple solutions or platitudes or anything like that. We want to say, I hear you. I hear what this is for you. And I'm trying to understand exactly what this means to you as much as I can. So think of a response to his statement of P8, something like, it sounds like you've reached that time in your life where you have little to no say in what happens to you. We're all going to be there. We live long enough. This is going to happen to us. We're going to have people making decisions for us. Um, and that's not possibly going to be easy for us to, to accept. But that's the reality for the vast majority of people who live long enough. They reach a point where you have little to no say in what happens to you. Or another response. It sounds like what you want doesn't matter. Imagine you live your whole life independent, strong, capable, and suddenly what you want is irrelevant. Or it would be wonderful if you were not being forced out of your precious home. Yes, so? As usual, there's a hundred responses, but no questions. Try and sit in that space of what would it be like for me? To really want to go back to my home, my castle, but I can't. They don't think I can. They don't think I can look after myself anymore. And, and maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. Maybe it's not safe, but it doesn't change the fact that I want to. I wish I could. So get into that space and and respond in that way. And this bloke is going to say, "Yeah, you get it. You understand. You see." And that's the goal in the pastoral conversation. P9, he responds to the question. Again, notice when you ask a question, people respond. His response to she's not in, living in the house was, no, she's in a home too. She doesn't come and see me either. Neither does my grandson. There, to me, off the verbatim, there's a real sadness to that statement. There's, to me, there's, yeah, there's just, I feel that statement for, from him. The chaplain says, not having that contact must be hard for you. Again, the chaplain's picking up something in that sentence that's really hard for this man to, to sort of accept. But again, find another word for hard. For example, painful. You know? Yeah, to me, painful suits here. That's what it sounds like. Disappointing. Yeah, lonely perhaps. Remember, they'll supervise you if you get it wrong. For example, if I say to this bloke, it sounds rather lonely for you. It sounds really a painful situation. He might say, oh, no, I don't get lonely. 
but it makes me sad and annoyed that most of my family seem to have forgotten me. Something like that, you see? P10, the only people that see me are my niece and nephew. I don't know. I'm going to be 90 next week. I don't know what will happen after that. We'll see if I make it to next week. Wow. And he says, you're missing your home. Having your niece and nephew visit show that they care for you. Again, I didn't get from what he just said that he was missing his home. I know he's missing his home. I know he wants to go back to his home. Okay. But in just what he said, right, I would rather respond to those feelings around the uncertainty about what tomorrow is going to hold. I'd also respond to the fact that he's missing his wife, that she's not visiting. And I don't know why she's not visiting. She may not be able to. I don't know. But I want to respond to what I would imagine. How would I feel if I'm in a nursing home? I not only can I not go home, but I can't see my wife, the love of my life. I can't see her. You know, and my grandson, he doesn't even visit me. Like, all of a sudden, I'm a ghost. I've become invisible, you know. So that's what I want to respond to, you know. And I don't want to have a fix. This is a fix. Having your niece and nephew visit shows they care for you. Like, no kidding, but that's a fix, you know. It's almost like the chaplain's trying to say, look, I know you're sad, but not everyone's forgotten you. There is your niece and nephew that visit. They wouldn't do that if they didn't care about you. See, people care about you. Guys, it's a fix. It's a silver lining on the fact that very few members of his family are visiting him. You know? Uh, I think that's a, a situation that many elderly people are finding themselves in today. That they've worked hard. They've looked after their family. They've sacrificed so much. And now when they need their family for a whole bunch of reasons, they're too busy, they slot them in a nursing home and don't visit them very often at all. It's, it's a really sad situation. The only people that see me are my niece and nephew. I don't know, I'm going to be 90 next week. I don't know what will happen after that. We'll see if I make it to next week. Guys, there's a real sense of hopelessness and inevitability in his voice that comes through to me from this verbatim. It's almost like whatever is going to happen, he won't have to put up with it for long. You know, he sounds like at any time he could pass, he could die, who knows? It's like, I don't know if I'll even make it to next week. So responding something like at 90, your future is very uncertain or you know, this is probably not where you imagine you'd be at this stage of your life. Something like that to see if he wants to open up more, you know? Anyway, so that's the pastoral conversation. Again, if you were Alan, how would you have felt during that conversation? What was your sense of how the chaplain went? Um Again, I, I, I've answered this, but notice what happens when questions are asked. I make a point of this because so often stopping asking questions in pastoral conversations are very difficult for people. It was difficult for me. So when you can see that when you ask questions, you direct the conversations you by causing the person to have to answer you. And more often than not, it's just covering up for the fact that you feel uncomfortable or you're not really sure what to say. So, you know, questions are something that you really need to learn to contain in a, in a conversation like this. They're fine. Questions are fine before the pastoral conversation. They're fine after the pastoral conversation. But when someone's let me into their pit, into their world, I, I, I don't need to ask questions at that point. OK, it really does um, sabotage the very deep connection that I'm looking to create. This is, this is an important one. What other responses can you come up with? So look back through the verbatim, you know, and when Alan makes a statement, how would you respond? What, is, what are some things you can say? You can see in my verbatim here, my feedback, I said very often there's 100 responses you could make. Well, what are some of the responses you could make? Remember, your aim is to convey that you understand how they feel, what this is like for them. So put yourself in their shoes and say, how would I feel? And when stuff comes up, you know, for you, respond in that manner. Or think about what are Alan's 
feelings? What are his losses? And when you can answer that, combine some of those elements into a response. I'll be more than happy for you to email me some of your responses for my comment. And I'll also be more than happy to have a look at any of your own verbatims, any small um, bits of conversation that you would like some feedback for. Email me at traumacompanions at gmail.com. I'd be happy to respond. All right, let me just stop sharing. Thanks again, guys. Um, I will put another verbatim out soon. Until then, God bless.